For nearly 30 years, the career of Dr. Ranjit Chandra flourished at Memorial University in St. John's. He was an expert in the field of nutrition and immunology, published in some of the world's most prestigious journals. But then something emerged, a pattern of scientific fraud and deception, and the shine was off a brilliant career. Tonight, our investigation continues with questions about money. Here's Chris O'Neill Yates with part two of our documentary, The Secret Life of Dr. Chandra. Cran sur Sierre is the kind of Swiss resort that attracts wealthy retirees. The kind with money and time to spare. You'll need more than prayer to make ends meet around here. This is where Dr. Ranjit Kumar Chandra has chosen to live, at least for part of the year, ever since he left Memorial University a few years ago. Few people here know that Dr. Chandra was once a world-renowned researcher in the field of nutrition and immunology. Few people here care that he once turned out a remarkable number of scientific studies. But that doesn't mean this hasn't been a place of opportunity for the doctor from Newfoundland. That a world-renowned university professor from Newfoundland would end up in Switzerland shouldn't come as much of a surprise. After all, a man with Dr. Chandra's reputation would have plenty of opportunities. But there's just one thing wrong with this pretty picture. When we investigated Dr. Chandra's career, we discovered that an alarming number of those studies that brought him fame were actually made up, faked. So the question we had is this. If Dr. Chandra didn't do all those studies, what happened to the money he got for doing all those studies? Somewhere hidden among these designer shops and restaurants is l'Université Internationale des Sciences de la Santé, a university that apparently specializes in health matters. It's one of those opportunities Dr. Chandra left Memorial to pursue. We've come looking for the institute that Ranjit Chandra says he now runs. I'm looking for Université Internationale des Sciences de la Santé, uh, uh, à Cran Sorcière. Est-ce est que vous le connaissez? Non, désolé. Et moi, je le connais pas. Ça vous dit rien? Ça me dit rien du tout. Je dis que c'est à Cran Sorcière. Cran Sorcière. Ah ben, je sais même pas. Vous voyez? Uh, c'est l'adresse. C'est à Cran Sorcière. Ah, c'est this is all we could find of the university that Dr. Chandra claims to run. A post office box. But that's not surprising. When it comes to deception, few people are as skilled in the art as Dr. Chandra. The old Janeway Hospital in St. John's, where Dr. Chandra worked, is abandoned now. So too is his office next door. For 27 years, he saw patients here and conducted his research as part of the medical school faculty at Memorial University. He left Newfoundland abruptly after it was revealed that he'd likely made up data for a study. In fact, we've uncovered many more examples of fraud and that may be just the beginning says the former editor of the British medical journal, Richard Smith. People who behave fraudulently tend to behave fraudulently in all aspects of their life. And you see that, unfortunately, fairly commonly. So my suspicion, not proved, is that there will be extensive fraud throughout all of this work. Indeed, our investigation reveals that Dr. Chandra's deception may not have been limited to his studies. The scientific fraud that helped bring him fame may also have helped to bring him fortune. On the surface, at least, Dr. Chandra's life appeared to be pretty normal. Up until he left St. John's, he lived in one of the city's nicer neighborhoods his home attractive but not ostentatious, in keeping with what you'd expect for someone earning about $150,000 a year. And if Dr. Chandra hadn't divorced, a true financial picture of the man might never have been revealed. 
Tucked away in the files of the Supreme Court of Newfoundland is a stack of documents relating to one of the longest divorce trials in Canadian history. Chandra versus Chandra has been dragging on now for more than 10 years, as the two parties argue over just how much Ranja Chandra is worth. The answer comes as a bit of a shock. It was revealed during the divorce trial that in 1992, Dr. Chandra had 120 bank accounts around the world. The judge estimated the balance in those accounts to be more than $2 million. Dr. Chandra's bank accounts were located in such tax havens as the Isle of Man and the Jersey Islands. Although he told the court the money was held in trust for research, Dr. Chandra had opened joint accounts in his name and in the name of one or another of his children. So where does a university professor from St. John's come up with more than $2 million? Not even the judge could figure that out. But he did conclude that the money couldn't have come from his earnings as a doctor and professor. His job, however, did provide him with some questionable money-making opportunities. Navigating your way through Dr. Chandra's finances is a challenge. But bit by bit, an impression begins to emerge when you talk to people who knew him. Mark Mazor used to be a project supervisor with a drug company that once paid Dr. Chandra $50,000 to do a study for them. But when the company became suspicious of his work, they brought Dr. Chandra in for a discussion at their offices. And when we left and I took him back to his hotel, he said, gee, you know, that was really more of a consultation than a discussion. Uh, two weeks later, I got a letter from him. And the letter was, uh, Dear Dr. Maser, um, uh, for the consultation from a couple of weeks ago, I normally expect and get uh, $1,000 an hour or $5,000 a day. Would you please pay me? Uh, again, I was floored. It was remarkably brazen, and no one gets that kind of consultation fees. Uh, it was ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. But that wasn't the last pitch he got from the doctor. Dr. Chandra's own journal, Nutrition Research, was looking for a new member for its advisory board. He offered Mazor the position. And uh, in order to do that, I simply had to um, pay several thousand dollars and he gave a Swiss bank account number to deposit it in. And when I saw that, I, I was incredulous. It was, it was funny. I mean, it was so outlandish that it was funny. Uh, a couple of the other scientists at Ross got similar letters. So it became apparent then that this was someone who was interested in making money, uh, not really interested in the science, uh, and he was out to feed his bank account any way he could. It's not likely Dr. Chandra accumulated $2 million just by selling positions on his advisory board. The logical place to start looking would be in the records of grants and contracts he received while employed at Memorial. Their files show he brought in more than $1 million from various sources over the decades. We added up the amounts he received for the studies we've identified as fraudulent, and it came to almost half a million dollars. Memorial can't tell us how Dr. Chandra accounted for that money because their records only go back 10 years. And they acknowledge that not all of the money Dr. Chandra received went through the university. In fact, we've been told that some drug companies were in the habit of sending their checks directly to the researchers back then. Jack Strawbridge is the director of faculty relations at Memorial University. What do you know about the funding that Dr. Chandra received outside of Memorial? almost nothing. I mean, uh, I know that he, for, the, for the number of papers he published, he didn't have a traditional funding profile. You know, what I mean by that is a consistent sort of year after year uh, renewal of funding from the same sources. But he was always doing things. Um, and 
I, if, if you read the acknowledgments in the papers, he'll often acknowledge funding from such and such a foundation. I think that money went straight to him. Dr. Chandra has had many private companies and organizations to his name over the years. We've counted at least 12 of them. But one stands out as more important than the rest. During his divorce trial, Dr. Chandra told the court that much of the $2 million in his bank accounts belonged to what he described as a secretive organization he worked for but knew little about. That secretive organization is the International Nutritional Immunology Foundation. It may be secretive, but one thing about it is right out in the open. The INIF was incorporated in St. John's by Dr. Chandra, just a few months after it was first incorporated in the tax haven of Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein is best known for its offshore banking industry. As a country where the wealthy go to protect their money from the tax collector, and occasionally from ex-wives. The INIF was first incorporated here in early 1997, around the time Dr. Chandra's divorce reached the financial settlement stage. The head of this secretive foundation, at least on paper, is this man, Alexander Jeeves. He happens to be not a nutritional scientist, but the head of the Jeeves Group, the financial services company that manages the INIF's offshore trust account. We could find no information anywhere about the INIF, nor could we find any nutritional expert who'd ever heard of it. So we wrote to Mr. Jeeves. Your company website does an excellent job of presenting your financial credentials. Perhaps you could also forward us your medical research credentials, as well as some information about the activities your foundation undertakes. His reply? Our professional secrecy laws prohibit us from giving third parties information unless a legal assistance application through the proper channels is successful. Not the reply you'd expect from an organization that says it funds research on nutrition. In fact, the only person we could find who's received funding from the INIF is Dr. Chandra. So it's convenient that 22 of the INIF's bank accounts were held by Dr. Chandra and one or another of his children. Some of that INIF money went to fund a center which was Dr. Chandra's pride and joy. The WHO Center for Nutrition and Immunology opened with great fanfare in 1991. The center was sponsored by the World Health Organization and was supposed to promote nutrition research and education. However, documents presented in court reveal that Dr. Chandra used some of the organization's money to buy his wife a brand new car worth $36,000 US as well as other items for personal use. Memorial University that was affiliated with the WHO Center says they knew little about the center's finances. Would it surprise you to know that Dr. Chandra had uh, 22 accounts identified as the WHO INIF Center in 1993 and that some of those accounts were jointly held in the name of his children? That would surprise me. I didn't know anything about that. In fact, Memorial paid such little attention to the center, no one seemed to notice when the WHO withdrew its sponsorship in 1994. Even so, Dr. Chandra continued to refer to himself as the head of the WHO center. People seemed to forget that it lapsed and he continued to, the, the sign was on the wall and on his letterhead and stuff, and all of a sudden somebody said, hang on, I thought that had a time limit. Gee, we haven't had any money from them in, and I forget what it was, three years maybe. And uh, the Janeway administrator said, well, let's take the sign down. It's not, a, you know, it's not a World Health Organization center anymore. And that was the end of it. There's no way of knowing just how much money might be in that offshore bank account in Liechtenstein. But life does seem to have been good to Dr. Chandra lately. 
In 1998, he donated $20,000 to this Hindu temple in St. John's. In 2000, he made a $250,000 donation to his alma mater in India. And then a little something for himself, two aristocratic titles. The Baron of Tonville in France purchased for an undisclosed sum, and the Baron of Blackburn in Scotland, a title we're told he's now offering for sale for £80,000, or $162,000 Canadian. These days, Dr. Chandra devotes much of his time to his vitamin pill business. He set up a mail-order company called Javan to flog his multivitamin, the one backed by his fraudulent research. That company folded when his research came under fire. But he's got another business. This one sells vitamins in Canada and India. I'm tired of seeing this guy get away with the things that he's gotten away with. Uh, I've, he has a website where he's selling a, a product based on research that's already been uh, debunked and uh, pulled from a journal. Uh, and I, I think it's outrageous that this man is making a living and earning lots of money on data that's made up on being a dishonest scientist. We've asked Dr. Chandra repeatedly for an interview, but he'd never agree. And so we've tracked him down near his apartment in Grand Soucier, Switzerland, where we caught up with him on his way out to lunch with a friend. Hello, Dr. Chandra. Oh, I'm hi. Chris O'Neill Yates from CBC in, in Canada. Uh -huh. um, we've been trying to reach you for months and okay. had some questions for you. I'm wondering how does a researcher from Newfoundland have 120 bank accounts in over a dozen countries with millions of dollars? I'm not willing to answer it without my uh, lawyer. But what is the INIF? What is INIF? I don't know. You have to ask this all is, questions from my lawyer. This is, this is an organization that you say you started in the 70s. It has I'm an not offshore any account. Questions. I'm it has sorry. an offshore account in Liechtenstein. I'm not answering any question. Why won't you answer questions, Dr. Chandler? Because I want my lawyer to be there. Why? What have you to hide? Well, you ask my lawyer. But we've repeatedly asked you for interviews over months. Yeah, because you have you have gotten my emails. You didn't no, say I'm we not would. Ready you didn't at the moment to give you a full interview. Can you direct me to where your university is? If, if it exists... I cannot answer any question. You but can ask it a, ten times. But this is a university. I cannot answer it any question. It supposedly exists in this town. Well, you go ahead and investigate. I don't understand why you don't want to clear this up. I don't understand why you are here. <laughs> well, there's a lot of questions about your okay, research. Okay, go ahead and do your broadcast without any answer from me. But we've, we've done our work and now we'd like to give you a chance to explain yourself. No, I can only do yourself. that when my lawyer is present. Is, isn't this disturbing to you that world-renowned ex experts are criticizing it's your work? It's not disturbing because 99% of people in science and, and in broadcast are favoring me. We have. I guess that leaves us as the 1% who clearly have doubts. Late yesterday afternoon, Dr. Chandra's lawyer called to say her client had changed his mind. He would do an interview in a week if we would agree to delay last night's broadcast. We declined. Not long after we met him in Switzerland, Dr. Chandra told a newspaper that he was planning to concentrate on his business in India, where he said he hoped to motivate the Indian government to provide vitamin pills for the masses. Tomorrow night in part three, how did Dr. Chandra get away with scientific fraud for so long? How can you question this guy? Uh, he's world famous. Isn't the peer review process supposed to catch this sort of thing? And anybody who knows about peer review knows that sometimes it will pick up a fraudulent study, but it's by no means guaranteed to do so. And just whose job is it to go through Dr. Chandra's research to look for more fraud? It's not our job. That's part three of The Secret Life of Dr. Chandra, tomorrow night on The National. I'm Chris O'Neill Yates. Well, we're still interested in hearing what Dr. Chandra has to say. Our request for an interview stands.